So much for coming today. Um, this is our second career success speaker event, and we're so happy that this event is focusing on career success of these fabulous women here that have joined us today. Um, the, so the idea for this series really has emerged out of a lot of work that we've been doing here at USF Sarasota Manatee over the last couple years, really sort of reimagining how we can do academic advising and career services to best prepare our students for career success. Um, so when you walked in, you probably saw on the table that we had a set of career success workbooks laid out. Um, our advisors are using those workbooks, and some of you I see took some of the workbooks, which is great. Our advisors are using those workbooks to help students, our students really track their progress um, along what we have identified as six key elements of career success. Um, so knowledge, skills, mindset, networks, experiences, and credentials. So this workbook has been a great tool for us, but we've been thinking about a lot of different ways to help bring the workbook to life. Um, and that was really kind of the genesis for this speaker series today. Um, so we're really thrilled to have all these phenomenal women here today. And also, what better person than our own new regional chancellor, Dr. Karen Holbrook, to lead this event um, and to lead this panel discussion. And I'll introduce Dr. Holbrook now. Um, she'll talk a little bit about USF Sarasota Manatee, and then she'll kick off the panel discussion by answering the first question, which we'll also ask of all of our panelists. Um, to talk about their current role and what really most excites them about their job. So thank you all. Dr. Holbrook. Thank you, Lauren, and thanks to all of you for coming. We are delighted to see such a mixed audience in terms of community members and in terms of our own students and faculty staff. It's really, it's really great, and I thank our speakers especially for being here today. This really is very important to us for a number of reasons. Of course, because this is part of the Career Success Series, but also because it gives us a chance to tell you who have come from outside a little bit more about our university that we are very proud of. I'm glad that our speakers had a chance to walk around the building. For those of you who have never been behind the trees, and that's what I always talk about is behind the trees because a lot of people drive by and say, what's behind the trees? And what's behind the trees is a phenomenal university. So we're really excited that you are here to hear from some of our, some of our, our speakers today. But I'm not going to say a lot about the university, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. This is a university that's part of the University of South Florida system, soon to be the University of South Florida, period. And I think you know that with reunification, we will all be one university in USF in 2020. And this is the year that we will be planning with an overarching large task force. That, I shouldn't say large, it's going to be a task force that's put together with about 12 people that will do the overarching big picture image of what it's going to look like when we all come back together because we're going to come back together very different than we were before we separated. When we come back together, we also are going to need a lot of work groups because if you think about what it's going to take to bring three universities back into the fold after those three universities have gone this way, this way, and this way, it's going to be a lot of work and a lot of effort. But in the end, it's going to be very exciting because we're going to pull together a lot of opportunities for our students, and that's so important to us, for our students, because the, they will instead just not just have the 40 degree programs we have here, but they'll have the 340 programs that they can pick from. And they can seamlessly move among them across the three institutions. And when we start working together, we're going to see a lot of synergies among the different institutions that we will bring together even new programs so that what's going to happen here on the Sarasota Manatee campus is going to be quite different than what we have right now, including PhD programs and including an EDD program. And the EDD program has already 
Dr. Jones, right, going to, and Dr. Bird, both, is going to start almost immediately in terms in fall. So for folks in the community who want to come back and get an EDD, this is going to be the place where you can start it and it'll finish and you will end up with a USF degree. So I'm going to stop talking because you want to hear from these people more than me. But this is, anytime anyone, anyone wants to know more about this campus, there are many of us who would love to tell you because it is a very special place and it's a place that's going to keep growing, building, and becoming successful for the purpose of student success. That's our overarching central goal and it always will be. And the kinds of things we do around it in terms of these kinds of programs and in terms of our community outreach, in terms of the programs we develop, the research and the experiential opportunities for our students and the fundraising that we do are all for the purpose of building success among our students. So that's by far the most important thing. And we have a lot of building projects that we think are on, that are essential for student success. So with that, I am going to start the first question. The first question was, I was told I should answer it right away, and that is, what describe your current position and what excites you most about that position. So my current position is the regional chancellor, and what excites me the most is the opportunity to be on a campus like this with outstanding faculty, staff, and students, and the opportunity to build, and the opportunity to make this campus more visible to everybody in this community. So I'm, I'm very privileged to be here, and I'm going to start with you and let you uh, pass along what all you want to say about yourself and what excites you about what it is you're doing. Okay, great. Uh, my name's Erin Duggan. I am the Vice President at Visit Sarasota County. I've been there for about 14 years, and we are the 501c6 that markets Sarasota County outside of the destination. We do that through the collection of tourist development tax. So anyone staying in a short-term rental accommodation uh, under six months in Sarasota County pays a 5% TDT tax, and of that, about 38% comes to us at Visit Sarasota County to market the destination. There's lots of other things that uh, the TDT tax does, which is great, but... Um, Today, I'll pretty much talk about the promotion. So I oversee the market research, the advertising buys, uh, the visitor services, and then, of course, the content, the website, the public relations. Uh, I often tell people I don't do what Erin Duggan wants to do because it's pretty or it sounds fun. Um, I am not the target uh, demographic of who uh, comes to Sarasota County on vacation, so we look at research to dictate what we do. As far as what is the most exciting element of my job is that really every month something's changing digitally. Um, how we track you uh, digitally is super creepy um, and fun. Um, I know who's seeing our ads, when they end up in our destination, you know, by their zip code coming into our destination from their mobile device. And so I think, quite frankly, every day it changes and we're having to shift how we market. And I think that's what keeps it exciting. Can you tell us, too, I'm going to ask each one of you so the rest of you can think about this. What, ex what about your job would excite our students, or how can you connect with our students? Uh, you know, it's uh, in the 14 years that I've been there, we pretty much almost always have a USF intern in our office. Um, in fact, we just recently hired uh, a recent USF grad. But I think for anyone interested in journalism, writing content, taking videos, shooting videos, uh, writing code, developing a website, pitching media, working with media, taking them on tours, taking meeting planners on tours. I mean, there's a lot of fun, uh, hospitable jobs. And so, of course, with your phenomenal hospitality department, we get to deal with not only your teaching staff. I'm so excited to see um, Kelly here. Um, but we get to deal with your students as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for USF students. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Green. Hello. I'm Diana Green, and this is really loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm the superintendent for the school district of Manatee County. We serve a little over 49,000 students and their families. Uh, we are the largest employer in Manatee County with uh, close to 7,000 employees. We manage a budget um, that, as last week, it was $886 million. And with the passage of the referendum that happened, thank you. 
we will be very close to managing a billion dollar budget um, for our school district and um, the passage of that referendum is so much bigger than the school district. Uh, it actually will impact USF that interns, and we were just talking, they're in our schools. We can now compete with Sarasota and Pinellas County for them to come and, and work in our school district. And those dollars eventually flows right back into the community. Uh, the thing that excites me about what I do is that uh, come every end of May, I have close to 3,000 students who walk across the stage and whose lives are now about to begin. And I feel somehow something I've decided, something that has happened to a teacher or anybody in our system has touched that person's life. And now that person is equipped to at least go start. And that we create these pathways for our students, whether it's through dual enrollment, uh, IB, ACE, or through our career technical programs, we are giving these young people many more opportunities than probably you and I had when we graduated high school. When I graduated high school, the only thing that was told to me was you need to go to college, and, and that was it. But we are providing multiple pathways for young people, and many of those pathways are taking in account with students with disabilities, students that are, um, have other challenges, and the fact that we in Little Old Manatee County um, are, we're becoming leaders in these pathways, not only in our state, but nationally, uh, is what excites me. It excites me that we're, we're giving our community this boost of young people who are ready to go out and lead. And they demonstrated that on March 14th when we had the national student walk out. Our students, we created a safe place for them to go. And I was at Manatee High, and I couldn't be more prouder of our students. These young people were organized. They recognized the victims. But yet they were willing to stand up and challenge the status quo of this country. And that is something to be excited about. Hello, so Lisa Leong, I am the um, CEO and president of SRQ Media, uh, a locally grown, locally owned media company here in the Sarasota Manatee area. And um, as the CEO and president, my real goal or my real sort of day-to-day -day is, it changes from day to day, but um, is to experience and to oversee the flow of the company um, to ensure that sort of all of our different areas in terms of revenue, which we look at as micro businesses, are performing well, that we are fully engaging and relevant with the community. Um, the biggest sort of journey for me and certainly for the company has been in the 20 years since we were founded, we've gone from really focusing on being a publishing company, which some people say, oh, you're a publishing company or you do magazines. Well, yes, we do, but that's not the reason we exist. It's not the reason we get up and get excited about what we do. And the reason we get excited about what we do is engagement, is the fact that we are a local catalyst for conversation in the area. We're a local catalyst for our audiences. And, you know, we were, we're not just happy um, covering the story or telling the story even. We want to be involved as part of the story. So in the last six or seven years, um, we have launched a human sort of portion of what we do, a lot of events. Um, just to give you an example, this past Friday, we were at the Hyatt with 64 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. We had a couple of 5th uh, grade girls who came in as well for Smart Girl. And Smart Girl is something that we created out of the Women in Business program, which was initially just a competition. That, um, and you see a lot of magazines doing competitions, the best of, and, and women in business. And we had these exceptional women at the very end, these 12 women, um, that asked a very important question. They said, so what now? And we said, okay. So you're ready. We had to be able to answer that question, and it's not just in the pages of the magazine. So they spent their time from 10 o'clock until 1, 1.30 on Friday 
mentoring these 64 young girls, everything from coding to soft skills, how to have a conversation, how to ask great questions, but also taking a look at all the various diverse industries that they represented. And that is very, what I would call, outside of traditional media work, but it's certainly um, what we're excited about. We're excited about looking at the transformation of what local media can really be to a community, and that's what gets me excited. We have had some exceptional students from the professional and technical writing um, degree program here at USF working with us, and it's been phenomenal. And I guess I would say for everyone out there, the more we can spend time on connecting with one another, creating partnerships, collaborating with one another, these soft skills are such a huge part of not only what we do in the community, but of every job moving forward. So be thinking about that. You've got your skills, which are phenomenal, but also how do I translate those skills into working into something larger and collaborating? Very impressed with all the work that happens here in collaboration with the community, so thank you. Thank you. Judge. Good afternoon. I'm Erica Quartermain. I'm a county judge, so thanks to USF for having me as part of this panel today. Um, I've been a county judge in Sarasota for four years. I was appointed by the governor and then reelected without opposition a couple years or a year ago now. So my role is uh, I hear cases uh, that are misdemeanor cases in the criminal division, and then I hear smaller civil cases where the amount in controversy is less than $15,000. So that includes evictions, a lot of commercial debt, small claims, and certain types of insurance cases. So um, I have a great job. I am thrilled with my job. I have been overjoyed since taking this position, um, but really the law overall is a dynamic profession. Um, prior to being a judge, I was a prosecutor, and that was amazing as well. So um, in terms of what I love about it or what is particularly unique is that I have so many opportunities to do good. In a normal week, I can see two or 300 people. And people come to court in their most vulnerable states. And they come for a variety of different reasons. Um, you know, in misdemeanor court, it is primarily good people who make bad decisions or uh, just simple mistakes. So there is a lot of opportunity to correct that at a very early stage as opposed to being in the felony court system where a lot of those people have been um, in the system so long, it is very difficult, but not impossible, to rehabilitate them. So I feel like I am um, part of a, a movement or um, this great system in which we are looking more toward rehabilitation in this, in this decade after some decades of focusing purely on the punitive um, consequences. So I have had the opportunity to work with a lot of different types of people on a lot of different issues, homelessness, human trafficking, um, you know, mental illness, and we have created a lot of great opportunities for people in that system caught up in those situations to do better. But even as simple as, um, you know, a traffic ticket when someone comes to court, if you can make that person feel comfortable, if you can give that person even an opportunity to pay, you know, in a, diff in a payment plan, they are so thankful because people are nervous and it affects their life. So um, I really enjoy being a part of that process and being a part of government because I feel like government's a great place to be, uh, but I want to make government better. And for students, I think that, like I said, the law is a wonderful profession. You know, you have to go into it for the right reasons. It's not like it used to be in terms of financial success for everybody, so you have to go into it for the right reasons. But like I said, it is, uh, there, the opportunities are endless. And um, being a judge and being an attorney gives you the opportunity to just do anything you want. It's, it's great. Thank you. I'm, I'm, thank you. I'm going to pick up on something that you've all said and pull back a few, few themes and a few threads that come out from all of you. First of all, thanks for all of what you've said. First of all, you can see that everybody's excited about what they do, and that is so important when we go into a career that we remain excited, and you all do. Secondly, all of you are doing something for somebody else. 
I didn't hear anybody say, well, it makes me feel so good because I'm moving up and I'm becoming this and I'm becoming that. All of you said how important it is to do what you do to better somebody else and to better our community. And I see that about this community overall. I think something else that you pointed out, and I think the soft skills are terribly important, and these are the kinds of things that students can learn a lot in their classrooms, but the soft skills are things they learn from people and things they learn from mentors. So I think that was an important thing to emphasize. Something else I was going to say, partnerships is important, and, and one of you emphasized starting with youngsters. And I think this is what we're finding, no matter what we do, is that if we begin with our kids, even in elementary and middle school, they're going to be better students for you, Diana, and when they get to, the, get to the whole school level, and you're going to see more of them going across the stage. So I think all of you said many of the same things. So you've talked about the exciting things. What about the challenges? What have you found, or can you cite one example of a huge challenge that you have faced and potentially overcome? Or maybe not. Whichever you want to say about it. You know, I think for us, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say politics, politics, I mean, that might be the same answer for all of us, but in our industry, uh, tourist development tax is a super fun pot of money for elected officials because their constituents aren't paying it. So it's very easy for them to want to spend that money on other things. And so if you go back to where TDT tax came from, it really was a group of hoteliers that got together because it was before there were a lot of flags. And when I say flags, I'm talking about Marriott, Hilton. Um, there were a lot of mom and pop hotels and motels around communities. And as you can appreciate in Florida, tons of them. And the hoteliers were saying, it is so hard for me to market my hotel and for you to market your hotel and for you to market your hotel. And we know, quite frankly, that when people come to stay in our hotels, they're really here to see the destination. And so that's where CVBs or DMOs, which is a destination management organization, stemmed from, was that these hoteliers said, let's collect a tax on our guests, and then we can utilize that tax to collectively market the destination. And so that's really what TDT tax is for. And in a lot of communities, you see 100% of the TDT tax collected going to promotion. So I think the fact that in Sarasota County, you've only got 30 some odd percent of it going for what it was intended speaks volumes. Um, and as we're perpetually watching uh, what the state is doing from a legislative standpoint, because they're continuing to put bills uh, forward to chip away at it even more. In fact, most recently, a bill did pass to utilize uh, tourist development tax dollars for things like roads um, or law enforcement. And it's not to say that those things aren't very important, but tourists are already here paying the sales tax when they buy items in a retail store or you know go out to eat. So it does seem unfair to hit them twice. And as you can appreciate in Sarasota, we just had a huge growth of hotels. Everywhere you look, there's new hotels. And those rooms aren't going to fill themselves. Well, I would have to agree. Politics with Aaron. Politics <laughs> plays a lot. <laughs> um, and it, it's, but for the school district, we have local politics, state politics, and federal politics that we have to uh, maneuver. And the challenge is trying to make really good decisions, yet you may have um, regulations at the state level, regulations at the federal level, or your own school board policy that can be roadblocks. Um, many times people feel, you know, public education, how hard could that be? I, I, learned, I went to school, so obviously anybody can do it. And, and it's, it's not um, as easy as people um, would like it to be. It's a very complicated uh, organization. Uh, you, you're the largest employer. As I just stated, our budget is almost a billion dollars, but yet we provide a very personal service, and that service is education. And, and when you talk to the average person, all they care about is they have children, is that classroom that my child is in, and that school that my child attends. However, we have 64 locations where children are being served, whether it is from pre-K to high school. And those services are not 
free. It requires the mindset of a business model because we have to pay insurance. We have to pay liability insurance. We have to cover transportation, gasoline. We basically are a city unto ourselves. Yet, I have five lovely board members that technically they're my boss. However, the 49,000 students and the almost 7,000 employees, they actually work for the superintendent. And so for me, I constantly have to find that balance between understanding that I have uh, a board, that board is being elected by the community, and yet I have students and employees that the decision I make, who am I making it for? And my measuring stick is always going to be Number one, is this going to be in the best interest of a student? And number two, if I can wake up in the morning and look in that mirror and be, feel good about myself, that decision was the right decision. I might not make everybody happy, but it is a decision that I know that it's going to continue to move the school district forward or individually support a student. And unfortunately, we like to take a broad brush and say one size fits all. I mean, we just had a bill passed that students who somehow, whether they've been bullied, can just now transfer to another location. Well, what does that mean? Uh, who, 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 who makes that decision that that is officially a bullying incident? So now we're going to probably spend months developing procedures, process, to try to implement that law and to ensure that um, we stay in compliance. So the, the, it's also, the it's, it's like an oxymoron, it's the challenge of the job, but it's also what makes the job exciting that, hey, if we get this right, we've done, look what we've done for students or look what we've done for our employees. So I, I would start by saying, you know, when you're in a good conversation with somebody and, and it's just you're completely absorbed in it, and you're in the moment, and you're just 100% right there having that exchange of ideas, um, there's a fluidity that's there that is it's not scripted. You don't have a, well, I'm going to call my best friend at, you know, 2 o'clock every, every afternoon, and I'm going to ask her the question. I know she's going to give me back, and I'll ask her a second question, and I know how it's going to come back. I would I would sort of take that as sort of a, of a microcosm of what's happening in the media industry. The importance of fluidity in the media industry in terms of transforming itself is huge. So we are constantly in a place where we're balancing the fluidity and the need to be nimble and the need to say, you know what, this isn't the story that's going in the April issue that everyone really needs to be engaged with. And I know we've been planning it for months and months and months, but something else has come up that's more, uh, more relevant and more important, more meaningful for our team. It is looking at um, our, our portfolio of events that we do in the community and saying, how do we do more different next year? You know, none of our events go the same way from year to year because our community changes um, and our needs change as, as a community. So keeping that fluidity um, it's sort of like building a puzzle where you don't know what the final picture is going to be. So there's a balance there between if we spent our days tethered in the, you know, in the clouds and coming up with different ideas in that fluid area, we'd never be able to implement. So as a small business owner, we're constantly asking ourselves, how do we balance the, the need to be fluid and the need to be responsive and the need to be aware that we're in a conversation with our region and with the people who live here um, at the same time, schedules, pro, you know, project management. The book has to leave at some point to the printer, otherwise they're not going to be able to get it back to us. You know, so the real hard sort of life of, of especially the editor side of what I do, is very much those schedules and deadlines and making sure we can get good work done in the time that we have, but constantly looking for the void, constantly looking for the question that's not being asked or answered. And so that's, that's probably one of the most challenging things for us as a team, being in the media industry and representing this great community, is that we're constantly having to kind of, um, you, know, you know, I'm thinking about one of those weeble wobble, um, you know, uh, toys from the ages where you're kind of just going back and forth and you have to be comfortable with the flow and you have to be comfortable with change and with moving back and forth and knowing that not anything is really going to be the same from day to day or from year to year. And getting comfortable with that is always a, is always a challenge. Judge. So my role is to make decisions. 
And, um, you know, in court, I often liken it to Star Wars, and that is what is good and what is bad. And things that appear good are sometimes not, and vice versa. So I come into situations cold with people I've never met before, and I have to make decisions about credibility and ultimately in uh, criminal cases about sentencing. So that can be very, very difficult. Um, you know, you learn a lot as you go through it and you stay alert. Um, but at the end, you know, there's always that question, you know, did I get it right? And, and when it affects someone's li life and they go to jail for a long time or they're convicted of something, that is very important to that person and the people in their lives and society as a whole. So, you know, every day I think about whether or not the decisions that I make, and I make a lot of decisions from, like I said, as simple as giving someone more time on a traffic ticket to putting someone in jail for, you know, a long time, um, to certain decisions related to whether someone's going to stay in jail, like first appearances with bond, things like that. So, you know, I think every day you just um, hope that the decisions you make are the right ones and that you stay um, on top of it with the law. That's, you know, it's not like you get to a certain point and the work stops. You don't coast. It always continues. So, um, you know, I would say that's, that's the hardest part of my job. Good. Thank you. Lots of different themes came through on this one. I think the politics, everyone can... Uh, everyone can attest to that those are the things that we worry about and work within and things that sometimes we don't like the answers but we live with them anyway because we don't have any choice. I really like the comment that in all of your jobs I think you have mentioned that you have to adapt and evolve. There's no question about that. We don't do the same thing every day and I think every single one of your jobs is built on knowing what the context is in your, in your discipline and where you're going to go next. Time management, finding the gaps in the kinds of things that are going on are really important in, in moving forward. And all of you described how moving forward is very important in the kinds of you're doing in self-assessment, which is also a very important criterion for anybody in a leadership position. And did I do the right thing, as you said? And I think no matter whether you you working with your school board or working with your patient, your students, working with your hotel colleagues or your colleagues in your team, did did you do the right thing? So lots of the same things come out. It makes me think about, you talked about challenges. Have you had any situations where you've had to show a lot of courage? And knowing that in expressing that courage, you might be making some people really mad because that's typically what happens. And uh, you're not going to make everybody happy. So where have you had to use some unusual courage to move forward what it is that you want to do. And let me start with Lisa, so we don't have to go the same direction. The others of you can think ahead. The most recent Great Recession was definitely one of those mega challenges for many families, many businesses, and many of us um, in many parts of the United States. That is probably one of the challenges that I would describe as where you have to really dig deep. Um, a media industry is not providing shelter, food, sort of basic sustenance that is necessary in terms of life. And many of the media companies that we saw that we've been collaborating with in different parts of the country didn't make it through the recession. Um, and we had to just really stop doing everything that we had been doing the way we had been doing it and change our entire minds and say, you know what, we do not know what next year's budget is going to look like. We can do some forecasting. We typically have been running on projections where we have sort of a cyclical uh, one year, back to the other year, back to the other year. So every other year is very similar in terms of how our business functions. And we had to completely throw that out. We had clients who were calling and saying, I, I can't do it anymore with you. You guys have been phenomenal and great. And we had to reach out and find a way to be there for those clients in a way that wasn't the traditional advertising mechanism. We had to find a way to help them create a, an ROI with their clients. 
how to create an opportunity for them to come into our offices, um, to create an event for them, to really talk about their story and share it in a way that was meaningful. And so a lot of what we had been doing was very much so more on the publishing traditional side. We had to throw it all out and say, we, we don't know if that's going to work, but what we do know is that the people who are with us now, we need to support them any way that we can possible. If that means that we need to change what we do in terms of what we bring to the table and make it different and make it resonant, then we have to. Um, but it was a very, very, you know, very, very difficult time. I often say that if you don't have a good challenge to push against, you really never grow. And boy, did we grow during that time. So let me ask you, if, if that's an example of courage, what would you do differently looking back in hindsight? Or, wouldn't, or did you do it right, everything right, the first time? Well, we never really do everything quite right, do we? <laughs> it's always 2020, you go back and think, oh, I would have done something else differently. You know, um, at that point, I think what we w I would have done is sort of exponentially commit even more to what we had done at the time. We stuck our toe in, we knew we had to make a change, but we made the change in very incremental steps. And in looking back at where that has led us today in our story, I would have been even more of a risk taker and done it faster. And I think risk taking is a very important part of leadership. So good for you. Erin, how about you? What, where did you show courage and would you have done differently whatever it is that you did? Yeah, so we're marketers, we're not brain surgeons, so I don't want to make it sound like I'm Indiana Jones saving someone's life by <laughs> this answer. Oh, but I, I always say that you learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. So every time we run a campaign, we always try to powwow after the campaign to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And I always say, and I'm very thankful that I had a boss at a relatively young age that when I told him a mistake I had made, he looked at me and he goes, and? And I was like, well, what, what do you want me to personally pay to fix this? And he goes, Aaron, if you're not making mistakes, then you're not working. Yeah. He goes, so if you're not coming in here every couple of months and owning up to some mistake you've made, he goes, then you're not really doing anything, right? Because who doesn't make a mistake? So we, I really try to say to my team all the time, come and tell me your mistakes mm -hmm. after, the, after a program run. So whether we've created an ad campaign whether we create programs a lot, so Savor Sarasota Restaurant uh, Week, for example, is a program that we started about 14 years ago. So when we do a campaign or a program, we always try to talk about what worked and what didn't work. And so we own what didn't work, and then we try to figure out how we can do it better. So I think just not being afraid for failure um, and then talking about your mistakes and how you can keep from making the mistakes again, I think that that takes courage, but I, I encourage that in the office. And I own my own mistakes as well. Great. So, Jerrica. Okay. Well, um, you know, having been in the criminal system for a long time, I saw some things that didn't make sense um, when I became a judge, and that was specifically the incarceration of those who are seriously mentally ill. And as a result, I um, worked with a small group of people to initiate a program to address the needs of those individuals which would include diverting them from jail. And that is extremely risky because when you remove someone from jail, then you are putting them in you know, the real gen pop and they could potentially hurt somebody else. So you know, by sticking my uh, neck out and this small group of people who worked on this particular program, you know, um, we, believe strongly that those folks who were suffering from mental illnesses were not dangerous and that the jail is not a de facto mental health institution. But when you release people um, and you, into a program, you know, just let them out, but you know, into a program, you hope that they don't go out and hurt somebody. But, um, you know, we have to stand by the data. Um, we have to stand by what's right. And, um, you know, thus far we've had a lot of success and no major issues. But coming from the criminal system where, like I said before, there was a very punitive culture, um, it was a change in the paradigm. And it took a lot of courage from those involved to stand up and say, you know, yeah, I guess we could live in a really safe environment if we just incarcerated everyone. And, uh, but is that the right thing to do? Let's take a chance on people. 
But when you give them that opportunity, they show that they can be rehabilitated and they do most of the time improve. So I think that was a difficult uh, a challenge for me and something that I took a risk on. But I think that people generally understand that, that that is the right thing to do. And there are always risks in the world, uh, but we cannot simply just incarcerate everyone. So um, there are judges who have let people out of jail uh, for very understandable reasons. Like they were incarcerated because they couldn't pay the court costs when they were on probation. That's not a reason to incarcerate somebody. Well, then that individual went out, this happened in our community, and then killed a little girl. Well, that judge um, was you know, called out on national news networks and ultimately stepped down, but that judge did not make a decision any different than any other judge would have made under the law. So oftentimes public perception about things that occur is not reality um, when judges make decisions, and certainly um, the, the greater good is to attempt to give people the treatment they need instead of incarcerating them. So I think standing up for what's right is, is really important, but it can be very challenging. Did you get pushback? You know, I think initially we did get a lot of pushback because it was that concept of diverting people from jail um, and then putting them into treatment facilities. There were people in local governments who said, well, you know, we're not going to open up a mental health institution. And I'm like, uh, you don't get it because that's what the jail is right now. And when you open them out, when you open up the front door and they just walk down the street, that's not safe either because that is what occurs. I think when you take the time to educate people, and a lot of people come with preconceived ideas and you dismantle those through respectful conversations and education, then you can get what you want. Terrific. Thanks. Dr. Green. Mm. Dr. Diana. Well, this is really loud. <laughs> well, I think the one mill referendum was the, yeah. the very, well, today, probably, I, I'm going to use some courage today, but <laughs> if the referendum, moving that um, forward with our board and knowing we had opposition, knowing that there is a segment of the community that did not want it to happen, and to be prepared every time we went out to present, knowing that I, there was someone sitting right next to me that was saying, no, the school district is, they're not doing what they're supposed to do, they're not um, handling the money that they currently receive. You know, you have to have a very thick skin and you have to be able to let those things roll off and you have to accept that that's that person's opinion and, and I'm not going to um, argue on their opinion. The only thing I'm going to argue is that if the information you're sharing is not correct, I will correct you. So the courage was that each time, you know, it would be a different person. And sometimes the dialogue turned into attacks and attacks on me personally. And you, you just have to, again, I wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, you know that information's not true, you know what you're doing, and, and you have to move forward. Um, were there things we could have done differently? Absolutely. Um, but since it passed, I don't want to care about thinking about what we should have done differently. We passed. Uh, Very glad so. that it passed. I'm going to ask a question that's probably a little bit, um, I shouldn't ask, but I'm going to. Do you think making a tough decision is easier for a man than it is for a woman? Do you think there's a gender difference in making tough decisions and taking courage? Do you think the outcome is any different? Absolutely. Okay. I'm sorry, it is. No, I, it is. How about you, Part Aaron? of courage is the fact that I am, not only am I a woman, I'm an African-American woman. And many times people try to marginalize my credentials, marginalize my knowledge, marginalize my expertise. And I constantly have to um, be there to prove them wrong. And so that's why I said, I'm sure today I'm going to have to use courage. Um, it, it can become quite draining that every day I don't, I don't ever get to have a B day. I have to have an A day every day. I have to be on my A game every single day. And even on the days that I'm not working, 
when I go to the grocery store, everybody, oh, you're the lady on TV. Mm -hmm. Or, <laughs> you're, <laughs> or um, it, it reflects in that um, I can never be dressed down. People tell me all the time, you look perfect. That's because I have to. Mm -hmm. It's not because I just wake up in the morning and say, it's you know, I love wearing baseball caps, but I never wear one out in public because I don't, um, it becomes all of a sudden, um, I'm less than if I'm not in this perfect um, state. And for women, my, my words of wisdom is that if you want what any one of these women want, then you have to be true to yourself. But at the same time, if you're being true to yourself is going to be a roadblock to getting where you want to do, you have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And for me, I made the decision, you know what, though I love wearing baseball caps and um, I'll, I'm not going to do it. And every time I go to the grocery store, yes, I will have lipstick on and my hair will be perfect and I will be dressed <laughs> that they, you know. So it's, it, it really, it. <laughs> you really have to make it up in your mind. Whereas for a male, oh, he's so down to earth. Look at him in his jeans and, <laughs> you know, he's like one of us, you know. <laughs> Well, I really <laughs> send you off on a different track, didn't I? But, but I, I think it is worthwhile thinking about because how about you? Have you had an experience where you think you maybe are treated a little different? That, I should get off this, but I, I, I thought your comments were so good. I try grocery shop at 7 a.m. on Saturday mornings <laughs> so, uh, so that I don't run into anyone, so that I can wear my baseball hat. Um, you know, stereotypically, I think sometimes women do tend to be better decision makers in that they tend to care more about feelings. So I'm always forecasting, okay, I'm about to tell this person no. How is that going to make them feel? Okay, it's going to make them feel bad. So I'm going to deliver the message in a little bit of a different way. So I think sometimes maybe women do that maybe more than men. I know my mm -hmm. husband most certainly is <laughs> thinking about people's feelings when he's delving down a decision. But I know when I build a team, and I have built a team that's pretty diverse and that I don't want everyone to be like me. Mm -hmm. um, I want us to all have different strengths and weaknesses. And so when I do tell the 25-year-old man something on my team, I'm probably delivering it very differently than I'm delivering that same message to the 60-year-old woman on my team. So I just think when it comes to decision making and gender and whatever uh, other demographic you're looking at, I just think maybe a good leader is uh, taking into consideration that person's mm -hmm. feelings and how their style is preferred uh, in, in doing that. But I think because I think about things like that, I do tend to maybe manage better than maybe someone who just had their style and didn't take other people's styles into consideration at all. Women are very sensitive, typically, to different people and who they're working with, so good comment. Judge, how about you? You're in a very competitive field. Um, you know, I certainly have seen both men and women make decisions in similar ways, in different ways. I really can't say, I don't know if it's harder for a man than a woman, because I've never, you know, I'm not a man. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think, um, but in terms of, it, the second question I think was, you know, have we been treated different? And it's like, yeah, every day people walk in and they're kind of like, huh? <laughs> what are you doing here? You know, and so, um, and then certainly when I was first appointed, I um, encountered a lot of, negativity like you were saying which is I would have to constantly um, you know uh, defend myself like you know I didn't just plop here and it's not like um, the people who vetted me didn't know what they were doing I am qualified to do this job and people thought oh well she just got it for this reason or that reason and so it took a long time to earn people's respect some of whom I will probably never earn their respect but um, you know I think after a certain amount of time a lot of it goes away, but it doesn't completely go away. Thank you. Lisa, one last comment, and we'll move off of this. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great conversation point, though. Um, uh, so being someone in the creative class, there's probably, I, I, I think most of the individuals that I interact with are either very, uh, very 
um, hear me roar type uh, women who don't even spend any time thinking about, well, should I or could I have, et cetera. And then many forward thinking men. Um, you know, when I chaired the chamber and went through that sort of process, and I was in, you know, deeply involved with that organization for about 10 years, and I remember thinking to myself when I first came in, it's mostly guys, and they're all in suits. And, you know, this is not a place for either A, a youngster, which I was at the time, not anymore, um, not a place for a youngster, definitely not a place for a woman, maybe not a place for an Asian American woman. But I think, you know, what you do is you just stop thinking about what everyone else is thinking. And you just start thinking what you want to think. And then suddenly, sort of along the way, you realize that the assumptions that you had made about how you were going to be treated or why that person was looking at you a certain way, you realize are conversations that you're having in your mind, and they may not always be reality. So I think that's, that's a big point, is that when we have the conversation with ourselves, is just stop listening to what you think other people are trying to tell you, and just really put yourself forward and say, you know, if it doesn't go, it doesn't go. If I, I wore jeans to the very first meeting of my, uh, of my chairmanship, and I was told many years ago, don't wear jeans, make sure you're in a suit, it's got to be a blouse, preferably silk, you know, and it was from people who had chaired in the past, but it was a different era. Um, and so I think you bring whatever strength you bring, and you encourage others to, to follow that path as well. Terrific. All good advice from everybody. Thank you. Let me ask you another question. We're running short of time and we've got so many good questions, but what about networking? Um, I think all of us have lots of networks and think about your networks and how they've helped you as well as how have you used your networks to help others. I think networking is so important. So let's start with Liesl. Um, okay, so um, two quick stories, and I'll try to keep them very short. Networking, everyone talks about networking, but not many people know what to really do with networking. You know, walk into a room and there are many people that you don't know, or you become involved in the group or a club or on a committee or a board, and you're getting to know people, et cetera. And my advice to women uh, who are looking to network and really become more engaged is be there for the work. Don't be there just to network because the most amazing relationships that you will create are through the work. It's not just meeting somebody. That's the beginning of the conversation. That's the tip of the iceberg. But being able to find work that you can passionately do together, that is really what true networking is about. And, you know, I mentioned, I see Dr. Sandra Stone back there, who's one of our leadership circle ambassadors. Hi, Sandra. And, um, and so she knows this firsthand. When we started the, um, the Women in Business Initiative, and that, that started as a competition and a small get-together that was supposed to end at 7 o'clock at night. It ran until 9.30 because we couldn't stop the conversation. Um, we looked for ways to leverage that relationship that we had with these women past just a networking scenario. And we asked them to give of their time. And I think that's another misconception. I think people think that when you ask someone to do more, you're, you're asking them to do something they don't want to do. But when you ask them to do more, that is the way they actually become engaged. That is the way that they actually tap into their passion. So I'm always looking for ways to ask the people I'm in, or, you know, I'm in relationship with or I'm partnering with, how can we do more? And I think that ends up with a 1 plus 1 equals 3 scenario. Terrific. How about we'll go this direction? Judge. Okay. Well, um, you know, I'm going to preface this with I'm in government, okay? So <laughs> um, I'm not in business. And... That said, I've never really liked the concept of networking because to me it implies that something is a means to an end and that I am like using something or someone. And so I don't really ascribe to the theory of networking. I think what you and I are saying is the same thing though is do whatever it is that you would do and do it because you love it and you will create relationships that way. Do not do things to put them on your resume. Do not do things to meet a certain person or you know, get to a certain company because you want to work there. That it just, life doesn't work that way. People see through it. And so I would just say, do what it is that your heart tells you to do and things will fall into place. Great comments on networking. Dr. Green, what are you? Well, I don't really call mine networking. Um, as the face of the school district, I feel it's my responsibility to not only our school district, but our community to connect the two. So I do a lot of mine through sitting on boards, being part of organizations, because most people don't understand the school district. Like I said, they, they, they 
isolate it to that classroom, that teacher, or that school. And so when I sit on boards, I have an opportunity to share the story of the school district. I have an opportunity to let people know that, that, that not only are their children in good hands, but the tax dollars that you pay are being utilized um, effectively and efficiently. So for me, my networking is that I make myself available. I, I know I talked about the grocery store, but every year, I attend at least one football game from every single high school. Now, I don't have a high school. My children are adults. But the parents connect with me because they see that well-dressed superintendent <laughs> <over there. laughs> with her perfectly starched jeans on. Uh, ah, so at, jeans at the, go to football Yeah, games. at the football game. And they, and they, they see me. That's how they say She's one of us. She's cheering on Palmetto High School. She's cheering on uh, Lakewood Ranch. Or, and I make sure anytime any one of our teams makes it to the next level out of districts, I attend that game. Don't, I, it doesn't matter what sport it is, with the exception of soccer. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm working on that. That's one that I'm going to have to work on. Um, soccer is, is a very lengthy sporting event. Um, it's amazing how the coaches, they, because I am a woman, they need to know. I support our athletic programs because I know for many students that is the one thing that's probably keeping them in school. Uh, so I want them to know I am here supporting our students and our community. So for me, networking means um, if there's an organization out there that eventually their impact is going to help our schools, if they ask me to serve, I'll say yes. But I always preface, please don't put me on something to do because I, I actually spread myself too thin, but just my name connected to that organization helps the school district and vice versa. It helps that organization. Perfect. So a lot of my networking is about serving on boards that benefit not only the school district, but it benefits our community. It's, it's really connecting. And you've all said something a little bit different than what people think of as networking. It's been great. How about you, Erin? And then we've got one real quick last question. Is that OK, Lauren? OK. So I talk a lot about quality over quantity. So even earlier when I was talking to someone about tourists, I'm like, well, wouldn't you rather have less tourists that come and spend more money than more tourists that come and spend less money? So I look at my networking or really what I would call my community involvement in the same way. Is I would rather be um, really respected for hard work with one organization than spreading myself too thin. So I'm the current president of the Junior League of Sarasota. There's a lot of Junior League uh, ladies in the audience, so I had to give a shout out to the Junior League. But, you know, I think a lot of people look at the Junior League and think, okay, it's a bunch of women doing really good stuff. That's really not what the Junior League is. The Junior League is a training organization. So every placement I've ever had in my 18 years of being in the league has been a training opportunity to make me a better community leader, to make me a better uh, volunteer. And so I would just say if you can look out for opportunities that teach you and make you a better person, whether it's professionally or personally, then to me that's the the, the ticket. Now, I do try to go to chamber events, but really that comes from a place of serving as well, because I know uh, I sit behind a desk a lot, and I want to make myself available. Uh, I do consider myself to be a public servant in that it's my job to represent the hospitality industry in Sarasota County, and I want to make myself available. So if by attending, um, you know, a chamber meeting, someone from a small hotel can come up and share an idea with me, and I'm just kind of making myself more available by doing so, then that is serving its means as well. Terrific. One last and quick, because Lauren wants me to stop, because, <laughs> <laughs> but this has been so good. I think you've all offered so many different things about very complex careers. One piece of advice you would give somebody entering your career. Let me start with you, Judge. One? Just one. <laughs> uh, you know, I would just say, never give up. I mean, that's, that's a good one. Yep. 
Liesl. So I'm going to take it from a small business owner. You got to love soup to nuts and you don't have to, you know, you got to be able to take out the trash and, uh, and facilitate the meeting. Good. Diana. I think it's a, you have to love children uh, because they can do some things that really try your patience. <laughs> and, no. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I remember when I graduated college, my mom said to me, oh, honey, you don't have to find the job. You just have to find a job. Yeah. And um, I, you know, sometimes when I interview people and they're very particular about what they want to do and they're, you know, to me, if you're not, you should be doing something. Get your foot in the door. You know, that's better than looking at someone who's like, well, I've not worked in six months because I can't quite find what I want. So. Perfect. I'm going to finish it up and say one thing. It has nothing to do with my career, but in general, in any job you take, one of the pieces of advice I always give is have fun. We always spend so much time at work and with our colleagues, so much more so than we do at home. If you're not having a good time, if you're not having fun in some of what you do, find something else to do. Because life is too short and we're all working too hard. So there's got to be some fun in what it is we do. I think these have been fabulous women and wonderful, wonderful talks. You can hear the complex careers that every one of them has developed and is continuing to develop and evolve. So I think we're incredibly lucky to have had you here today, and I thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Holbrook, and thank you all so much for taking time to come here today. We did prepare some nice uh, gift baskets for you to show your appreciation. Actually, there's some coffee in there. I'm sure you all need coffee on a regular basis to do everything you're doing. So thank you again so much, and we're happy to present these gifts to you. Thank you.